Hello and welcome to this episode of our Rhinoplasty for Residents and the Foundations of Facial Plastic Surgery webinar series. We really hope you have a great time watching this show. I'm Dr. Chauke Malinga Kensani and I'm the Secretary General of uh, SOSA and I'm going to talk about basic nasal anatomy. Uh, Peter Palhazi spoke to us about advanced nasal anatomy and it was amazing, but I'll take it down quite a few notches so that we can all catch up by the time we do the World Rhinoplasty series. I have no disclosures whatsoever, but uh, for this talk, I've used uh, pictures from Nelligan from Peter Palhazi's book, Preservation Rhinoplasty, which I absolutely loved and um, anatomy atlas and some of the pictures are from the internet. Dr. Kinsani, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I, it looks like your uh, screen might be out of focus a little bit. Um, would you be able to try clicking on your slide and then pressing the escape button? Okay, click on this. Oh, when I click on the slide. Or escape. just, just, yeah, okay. And then, um, yeah, try. sure. That uh, I don't there, know. that's 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 much better actually. Uh, and Is then maybe it? try pressing play one more time. All right, play slide show. There you go. But still, it's out of uh, focus. Isn't it? Yes. Um, yes, because there's a green bar on in front of the. Here we go. Let me try it again. Out of focus still? Yes, yeah, still out of focus. Um, is it possible to play your presentation from the screen that's showing right now? Yeah, because I'm seeing it as if it's a, you know, it's a rehearsal slide. You know what I mean? That's okay. I think you can carry on with it like that. Eh? Yeah, this actually looks perfect if, if that's okay is with it? you. Yes. Oh, yeah, it's okay. All right, so um, the reason why as a registrar or, you know, or resident, why I felt anatomy of the nose and physiology and uh, aesthetics of the nose was very difficult was because of overwhelming slides like this. So you would, you know, in your junior years, look at a slide or look at a textbook and see a slide that is overpopulated and you have a million things to read and you just feel like, you know, I, uh, there's no way I can comprehend this. And, you know, as a result, we all delayed studying, you know, anatomy of the nose and uh, aesthetics of the nose till later on in our training. So what I've tried to do is just to break it down to just simple uh, levels. Back. Now I can't move the slide at all if it's like this. I have to play it. So you can't see it when it's like this because otherwise I can't move it at all. There we go. All right. So my trick is um, just classifying structures into multiples of three. So you categorize what is the most important structure in the profile that you're seeing like the lady on the screen currently, you can see that, you know, you're seeing her side profile, but you know, for your, you, whatever you're going to do on the nose, you want to look at the radix, the dorsum, and the tip as the most important structure. Then you can populate whatever you want to populate around those uh, structures. For an example, let me give you the you know what I would populate around the tip. So once I know the tip, I know then there's a supra tip just above the tip. Then there's a supra tip break just above the supra tip. Then below the tip will be the infra tip lobule. So those helps you to, you know, just dividing things like that helps you to comprehend things a little bit better and things don't, you know, anatomy doesn't feel overwhelming. Okay, I'm just going to try and move to the. Are you able to use your arrows uh, by any chance when it's uh, on? No, I, it, it freezes the arrows completely. I so see. that's the main problem. So I have to escape each time. 
So um, this slide actually belongs in the analysis of the nose, but there has been a lot of confusion, especially, you know, when you're a registrar, because now you don't know how to, um, you know, just, uh, you know, annotate your, your uh, profile on the, uh, on the dorsum. So this uh, dorsal analysis is for the hump analysis. So it's not the one that you would use initially when you are analyzing the nose. So hump analysis is of the bony hump, not the cartilaginous vault. So you would look at the deepest part of your radix as the nasion. The caphion will be your, the most bulging point and the rhenion will be the most caudal edge of the nasal bones. So that's where it stops. The moment you say you use these words to describe anything beyond the bony vault, then you know even your examiners will, you will know that you don't know what you're talking about. So I just wanted to clarify that. Sorry, again, we have to go to. So moving to the next slide. Um, I have to um, just acknowledge that I got this, um, you know, thought of putting things into multiples of three or classifying from Manic. And we have to, you know, just credit him on that because, you know, his classification of lining support and cover has helped to put a lot of things into perspective with regards to nasal anatomy. He was, okay. Um, so when it comes to the cover of the nose, yet again, you can see the multiples of three that I've put there, the skin, the superficial uh, muscular aponeurotic uh, layer, which is the SMAS and the pericondium. But we all know very well, when you learn the skin, you have the epidermis, you have the dermis, you have the you know, subcutaneous tissue. So that's what you populate around that uh, slide. In, in case you get asked, uh, you know, just discuss the cover of the nose, then you know that around the skin, then you can, you can have further discussion. With the SMAS, um, you know, there are several very important muscles that I'm going to discuss shortly, but just underneath the SMAS layer, you have important blood vessels that run in the areola uh, tissue. So that you will need to uh, discuss around when you, you adding to what, you know, the, the SMAS encompasses. Then you have the periosteum peri and perichondria layer, which is, a, is quite a rigid layer. We'll discuss that because this is quite, you know, it, it has garnered a lot of interest because of preservation rhinoplasty. Okay. Um, this slide was quite interesting to me when I saw it. So I just had to use it because I have never, even on a, a African patient, I've never seen, you know, the subcutaneous tissue that, uh, you know, was that bad because there's a disproportion. Um, but uh, what you will notice is that the thickness of uh, the skin varies according to location. And this is what we know, your radix area will have thicker, subcutaneous tissue. If you touch your radix now, you'll feel that it's much bulkier, but mobile. And uh, when you touch your dorsum, you have a bit of mobility. And in areas where you have your SMAS, there is that nice glide. The moment you lose your SMAS over the, you know, the tip of the nose area or the lower legs, then you have this fibro fatty tissue that has quite a lot of adherence. And um, with, you know, this uh, skin thickness differs between different ethnic groups and between, uh, you know, genders as well. Males are known to have thicker skin than females. 
And what I don't want you to confuse is skin thickness and skin excess. So when you have an abundance of skin, it's something that needs to be reduced. It could be that you have thin skin, but you have a lot of redundancy in skin. So the management of that is very different to thick skin, which means you, know, you can manage it preoperatively by um, the, you know, sending them to a dermatologist or manage them yourself by using you know, a Ritalin, uh, not Ritalin, Roaccutane and uh, topical um, you know, products. But and intra-op for thick skin, you can defect and uh, reduce some of the, you know, the thick cover. So just that differentiation is, is very important if when you're assessing a patient's skin. All right. When we move to the next slide, these are the muscles in the SMAS. You know, the importance of these muscles are, is understated, especially in this day and age where anyone and everyone is using Botox judiciously. The, you know, not, people are not taking into cognizance that they can cause you know, uh, breathing problems with, um, you know, with, with something like Botox. Breathing problems almost equivalent to someone who has had a CVA because you're paralyzing the muscles that can control your external and internal valve. So when you look at uh, the muscles there, my mnemonic when I was studying for my exams was December. So the, you know, when you shorten December, you write DEC. But because we have minor dilators there, so you have depressors, which is the big D, the smaller D, which is the minor dilators, and then you have your compressors and your elevators. So you can see the, when you look at the procerus muscle that when it contracts, it shortens the nose and opens your nostrils so that you can breathe a little bit easier. But look at the nasalis the way it is. It inserts specifically, especially the transverse fibers, they in, insert you know, at the caudal edge of your lower lateral uh, cartilages. That's where the external valve is. So they are very key at opening that um, keystone area. So you, when you judiciously go and inject Botox there, or you do an extensive dissection and damage those, those muscles, you might end up with nasal dysfunction that you might not be able to fix. Likely with Botox, it will wear off, but with surgical damage, it, it's a whole other story. And you can see that um, the fibers, uh, the ala fibers of the nasalis as well, they, they insert on the edge of the ala. So when they contract as well, they pull the external valve and open it so that you can breathe a little bit easier. You can imagine when you're exercising that you need these muscles to be activated so that you can, you know, have less resistance in breathing. So um, the other structures I'll discuss just now. Uh, so it, in the SMAS, it will be muscle, the aponeurosis and the vessels. I wish I had a technical guy in here. Okay. Oh, I didn't move the slide. Good Lord. All right, so when we're looking at the muscles and airflow, I've, I've discussed this just now that, uh, you know, how the upper edges or the transverse portion of the nasalis, it, you know, just inserts on the extent, on the internal valve. Um, the one muscle that has been, you know, notoriously discussed in, in rhinoplasty is depressor septi. 
And I think those guys who've been doing rhinoplasty over the years know how, you know, the evolution of, you know, management of the nasal tip in relation to this muscle. So for the longest time, this muscle was blamed for, you know, the shortening of the tip and, you know, inability to derotate the tip, especially when someone is smiling. And the advice was to go and transect the muscle, then you'll get the derotation. But over time, what we found is if you put uh, adequate structure on the nose, you don't need to transect the muscle. The nose will maintain, you know, the, the, the position even when smiling, the, the patient is smiling. The only other reason to transect this muscle is if someone has a, a severe transverse crease over the upper lip when they smile and it bothers them, then you can go and transect the muscle and it makes you know the, the transverse uh, crease a little bit less. So when you look at the vasculature of the nose, it's the nomenclature is, is quite easy. Um, you know, you can look at the slide and think, oh my Lord, this is just very busy. But just, um, you know, bear with me for a second. So you, you have a plexus that is composed of external and internal, uh, you know, the, the carotid network. But look at the, the vessels that supply the nose. On the dorsum of the nose, it's a dorsal nasal artery. How easy is that? It's, it's on the dorsum, dorsal nasal artery. And on the lateral aspect of the nose, it's the lateral nasal artery, very easy, straightforward, supplies the tip. And on the you know, nasal seal and uh, a bit of the anterior septum or caudal septum, the, you know, the, the blood supply is uh, from the columella vessels, which is from the superior labial artery. So when you do, uh, or you, you open the nose through the transcolumella axis, what happens is your tip now is dependent on the lateral nasal artery. So what you need to be careful of is doing a, a nasal uh, wedge excision, the base excision, that is more than two millimeters out because then you will damage the lateral nasal artery. And after damaging the lateral nasal artery, you know, you will need Jesus because you'll go from planning your uh, aesthetic surgery to discussing reconstruction of the nose with the patient, which is not pleasant at all. So just be cautious when you're doing your open rhinoplasty and base nasal base excisions. Okay, so the next is the nef supply as easy as pi as well, because it's three major nerves from the trigeminal nerve, nerve number five. So infraorbital nerve and the external nasal uh, nerve are branches of the infraorbital, so which is V1. And uh, you know, the V2 is, uh, supplies, innovates the ALA base as well. So when you, you, you have to study this, especially when you want to do, you, to block the face, if you want to do life surgery, then you have to know areas when, where you need to block the sensory supply of the nose. Okay, it's coming to the interesting part, the most fundamental part of rhinoplasty because this is what we aim to do when we do rhinoplasty to improve the structure underneath such that it shows or it comes out even over a, a, an envelope that might be challenging. 
So the upper vault is a bony vault. The lower two thirds is cartilaginous vaults. I will, you know, with the, the bony vault, I'll discuss it further just now and, and the cartilaginous vault and the ligaments. Let me just go to the next slide. Um, so when you look at the bony pyramids, it's, it's also nice and easy. I know the, the, you know the picture is a little bit busy, but uh, just look carefully. The, you know, the nasal bones are paired and they, only, they make the bony vault and with the maxilla. So it's only the maxilla and the nasal bones. You, when you go from intercanthal line distally, the bone, the nasal bones thin out. So in the intercanthal area, if you try and do your osteotomies, you will struggle. But the more distal you go, the more the easier it gets. And uh, the articulations, uh, as you know, as you see them on the slide, so more. Uh, you know, the, the nasal bones above articulate with the frontal bone and the uh, perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone. But uh, on the sides here, it articulates with the maxillary bone. So that is, is easy when you're trying to describe the, the bony vault. When it comes to the upper lateral cartilage, it, cartilaginous vault, this is easy. Because to me, um, the upper cartilaginous vault is more like um, the middle child. You know, middle, middle child who doesn't get enough recognition for whatever they do. Why do I say that? Because you have the bony vault here, which if you, you have your your bony vault there, it overlaps the upper lats like that for about, uh, you know, between uh, five to 10 millimeters. So up to a centimeter. And in the overlapping, it not only overlaps the, the upper lats, in the middle of that, there is the, the septum, which supports the whole structure. And then you have the lower part where you have your, your lower legs, which are prominent and proud and try to, you know, take all the glory when you, you're looking at the nose. But essentially what provides middle structure and support structure is the middle vault. So the, this uh, upper lateral cartilages are paired, as you can see there on the slide and in the middle, you have your septum. On the, the base is on the septal edge, the apex on the maxilla, and inferiorly or caudally, it uh, articulates with your lower lateral cartilages. So the perichondrium, uh, when I was showing you the upper let and the lower let in, you know, just coming right under, what happens is there's perichondrium on the bone of the upper vault. And then you have oh, periosteum here, and then you have perichondrium. Then there's condensation of the two. That forms static support for that area. The reason why I'm explaining that, you know, in detail is because if you are going to use sculpting techniques to just reduce or, or to, to sculpt the bony vault. You might dislodge those condensations and that is static support and eventually dislodge the septum and destabilize the whole structure. So you should be careful of how much you're sculpting. And when you see that you're getting to um, structures like periosteum and perichondrium, just, just know that this is the point where I need to stop. Otherwise I'll get into trouble. Uh, 
Silicon. Okay. So uh, the keystone area is, you know, the most important thing about it being a keystone is there are several important structures that, you know, come together at, at that point, which is uh, the nasal bones, the upper lateral cartilages, the septum, cart the cartilaginous septum, and the vertical plate of the ethmoid. And I think Palhazi showed it quite well on his slide that if you go and do a, you know, a, an osteotomy and there is a fracture through the perpendicular plate, you can easily go through to the Cristagalli and have a CSF leak. So, and, and that is because of the pole and tent relationship between the ethmoid and the nasal. Uh, nasal bones. Okay. All right, the lower lets also simple structure, three components, the medial, the middle, and the lateral crura. So the medial would be your lateral, you know, your medial uh, crura foot place. These, um, when you see someone having the base of the columella that is quite thick, then you must be thinking of the structure of your medial crura. The middle crura, what it does, it gives you your nice domes. And the lateral goes towards your lateral um, low, lower cartilages. When someone says I'm doing a, a lateral crural steel, they mean they're stealing some of the lateral crura and pulling it medially to either elongate your, you know, the middle or support the, the middle crura or to, to give it a little bit more structure. Sometimes you just need to overlap. So it shouldn't be you know, a term that surprises, surprises you when you hear a lateral crural steel. The lower lets, like I discussed, they're very proud. They are, you know, they have greater impact on surface anatomy. And um, they are, although the, the, the cartilages don't run parallel to the ala cell, but they are the major support to the external valve. So you should, you know, have your lateral crural, you know, the, the, your lower legs intact, but you'll see that in most aesthetic um, rhinoplasty, what we do these days is just to put, you know, ala rim grafts, just because we know that the ala cell doesn't have cartilages. So once you've cut or you've made an incision, the tendency is to have the ALA retraction a little bit. So that is just to stop um, having the, the nasal retraction over time. Okay. So looking at the nasal valves, I think um, Cameron touched on it earlier that you should know your nasal valves because they are important for airflow and um, you know the you know breathing problems that the the patient will present with. So your internal valve is created by the caudal edge of your upper let and you know the uh, septum. So you would see it there that angle there. There you have it there. And the normal is defined as, you know, between 10 and 15 millimeters. So when someone, you know, when you hear of people putting spreader grafts, it's in, in attempt to increase this valve so that there is easier airflow through the nostrils. The, you know, the lower conquer as well, impacts a lot in, in airflow. So when we're doing the, you know, in, in, patient, in a patient who has 
functional problems when you do what you can just to improve breath breathing usually you would reduce the size of the inferior uh, nasal conca just to uh, improve the airflow the external valve like i i said before um, it's created by the caudal edge of the lateral cruise and the nasal septum but there is on the lateral edge, there is no cartilage. It's just soft tissue. So that we, we try and protect after making, you know, incisions um, just so that there is no retraction and you have a, you know, a competent, a competent external nasal valve. All right, so when we talk of the nasal base, uh, now it's easy because we, we've, we've just looked at the underlying structure. So it's, it's easier as well. You, do, you can divide it into three parts. You have the lobule, you have the middle, and you have the basal part. So three parts that you, you should think about. Usually our incision when you, you're doing an open rhino is at the narrowest point, the middle part. There is a divergence of your lower legs. So here on the rims, you won't find any cartilages, but you'll start finding your lower legs more in there. So the, the, the diverging crura from about 30 degree angle for tip to be formed and to avoid having a unit tip. There we go, okay. Nasal ligaments are very, very important. And um, now more so because uh, they, you know, they are those who are serious proponents of uh, preservation rhinoplasty. And uh, in preservation rhinoplasty, you must preserve as much as, as many structures as you can. And the, you know, the most important ligaments that will be discussed that you'll hear about are your interdomal ligament and intercrural. I'll show you on Paul Haas's book, it's pictures. He has the most amazing pictures. But I'm sure everyone has now heard of um, the, the Petengi ligament, which is the fascia and interalar ligament that connects the osteocartilaginous um, framework to the skin. So the, the, um, this cartilaginous um, you know, ligaments, what they do is they, pro they provide stability and prevents distortion of your nasal tip. All right, so this is from Palhaz's book. And uh, you know, the one, the Preservation Rhinoplasty book, it's an amazing book to read. It's, it's a short read and, and quite a fun read because I like pictures, a lot of pictures. So you can see your interdomal ligament. You can see how, you know, caudal it is. It's, you know, it, 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 no cranial, more, more cranial it is. So the proponents of preservation rhinoplasty say you can, if you're not doing a tip split um, maneuver, you can pres preserve this, uh, this uh, you know, ligament. And then you have your larger intracrural um, ligament, which um, you know encompasses the whole cephalic border of uh, your ala cartilages. So it it attaches your you can see your crura all the way, just to provide that extra stability. And um, the last picture that we have there. So this is his anatomical dissection, just showing what you see on those pictures. This last picture, um, 
it's, you know, when people start talking about sub periosteal subperichondrial dissection from the beginning. Um, this is how challenging it is. So these are the lower lateral cartilages. This is the upper lateral cartilages. This is, you know, the, the mucous uh, membrane. So your, your lining. So when you try and you do, and the, this is the vertical scroll ligament that, that attaches to the skin. So when you try and do your um, subperichondrial dissection from the lower legs, you're going, you know, just below your, okay, subperichondrium, which you'll find easily on the lower legs. But by, when you get there, that's where the challenge is because you can easily perforate the mucous membrane, the, the, that transition there. So it, it, it makes, you know, one doubtful if it's at all possible for someone who is just starting out to do this subperiosteal, subperichondrial dissection, because it, it is advocated for, you know, bloodless field, you patients who have very thin skin. Um, it, you know, it improves the outcome, less edema and less trauma to the supporting structures as well. Okay, um, almost done. So when we come to the septum, um, you know, uh, Cameron touched on this, that uh, you, you have to know the principal function of the nose, which is, it's a resonating cavity for the voice. It has olfactory function, and um, you know it's it's part of the upper respiratory tract, which is responsible for filtration, warming, and moistening of the inhaled air. It you know it's composed mainly of three main structures. You know these are the structures that they will ask you about in the exam. Um, you you have the vomer bone, you have the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone. This perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone, we often harvest if we need very firm support, especially in revision rhinoplasty, if you want a firm structure, but very thin bone. Um, and then you, you have a quadrangular cartilage. Also, you, you should remember that even when we harvest the septum, we leave an l strut. To, and we make sure that it's, it's about a centimeter or more just to maintain the structure of the nose, the structural integrity. The one important um, anatomical uh, point to mention is the anterior septal angle. This is very important, especially in revision rhinoplasty where the anatomy has been distorted, but you know, where the, you know the the inferior border and dorsal border of your your septum meet. If you can find that, then you'll be able to delineate to delineate your your planes much easier. So you you will be asked at some point to just you know point out where the anterior you know uh, septal angle is. It's just to make sure that you know how important a structure it is. The septal blood supply. Um, so you will ask me how, uh, you know, I tried to fit it into my, you know, multiples of three, you know, but to me, this artery has been featured before the superior labial when we were looking at the external blood supply. So that artery, we already know that it's there, it's, you know, it's fusing the cell. So it just happens to just cross the border and go into the septum a little bit. So um, then when you go up, you have, uh, you know, two vessels that you have the, you know, the common name. So it's, it's like, Cameron having, you know, two, you know, Cameron's legs, 
they are Cameron's legs, although it's a left and right leg, but they are Cameron's legs. So if it's um, anterior and posterior, they are still ethmoidal arteries. So if you can just remember the ethmoidal arteries, the two of them, one is in front of the other, then you have your anterior and posterior. So then it will be one, two, which is the sphenopalatine, and three, the greater palatine um, artery that come together and form the Castlebach area, which can bleed quite a bit. So you understand why we, when you do a rhinoplasty, you use a lot of local anesthetic, uh, anesthetic agent just to ensure that you don't have you know, ble active bleeders because then you won't see anything. Innervation of the septum, also easy. Um, three main nerves, the anterior ethmoidal and the nasal palatine and the internal uh, branch of the infraorbital nerve. So when you have um, injected the, uh, the infraorbital nerve, just, you know, just a centimeter below your orbital rim, you can expect the patient to have numbness there just at the seal. Right. Um, I won't go into detail with the with the intranasal structure, but I just wanted to show you. So this is the lateral wall, which has the superior, middle, and inferior conca. And these structures are very important as well in improving the airflow, um, especially the inferior turbinate. But I think this deserves a talk on its own because there are several ostia that comes in between. And uh, you know there's a lot of relevance in what the patients will present with to you, especially when they want a functional rhinoplasty as opposed to an aesthetic one. So I think we should just set apart another talk to discuss that. Um, so my last, my very last slide would be, I was um, at a museum and with my husband and I'm, I'm you know, busy looking at a, you know, the statue, but what amazed me was the detail in the nose. So I stood there like 15 minutes touching and, you know, I was very excited. And my husband turned around and looked at me and said, sure, I'm so glad you're not a urologist. So, but that's the fun of being a rhinoplasty surgeon, isn't it? All right, thank you very much for the, you know, being allowed to talk on this platform. What we will do, uh, together with uh, the help of Dr. Chrissy Sofianos is to try and put together MCQs and it just upload it on our website to ensure that you can go over, you know, some of the MCQs that might come up in your exams. And uh, this will just give you a little bit of practice. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Uh, Kenzani, thank you so much. I mean, it's a, a vast subject uh, but obviously absolutely crucial in terms of rhinoplasty. Uh, it really is the foundation and the fundamental to, to understanding what you're looking at, uh, how to manipulate it. So well done. That was a, a really whirlwind uh, tour through, rhino, uh, through, through nasal anatomy um, and slightly trying conditions without, uh, without having your, your PowerPoint playing normally. Uh, we don't we don't have any any specific questions. Is there anybody, uh, Cameron, uh, any of our, our local uh, Exco members that want to ask any questions at this point? Yeah, I'd like to remind everybody that um, Amir has just posted the links on the chat for the CME points. So it's two lectures. So if you can click on those and do that, please uh, feel free to, to, to do that. Um, and Feel free to invite other people, guys. The best way to learn is on these forums, you know. Um, and I want to encourage you that don't feel overwhelmed by the amount of information we've given you guys tonight. You know, we want to slowly, slowly work through these things. Um, Stu next Sunday is actually going to give a great talk on the na nasal aesthetics. 
And then Peter's going to go through a step-by-step -step basic surgery rhinoplasty. So um, I know it might, some, some people might not get as much out as other people would, but uh, we'd, we'd encourage you to share, share that widely um, because we really want to help. And what's come from our previous lectures, we did a study with Brian and, and it showed us that there's a need for rhinoplasty education for residents. So that's the, what, what the plan is on this. And Kent, can I ask you, which uh, anatomical textbooks would you suggest or resources? Yeah, um, you know, I found Nelligan is, is very good at detailing some of these, you know, anatomical structures and overlapping them with function. But it's, it's more for aesthetic rhinoplasty rather than a functional rhinoplasty. But Peter Palhazi, I find uh, his books have quite, you know, good operative detail. So if you want to start operating and see the stuff that you might encounter, then it's, it's better to read Peter Palhazi's books. Mm -hmm. Excellent. I see a question has come up in terms of um, how, how can you access? So we're going to be trying to post as many of these talks as we can on the YouTube channel. You'll see on the YouTube channel, there are already 12 talks that have happened in the last few weeks. We've very specifically kept the question and answer sessions of these world leaders in rhinoplasty. So we'd encourage you to go and read, listen to what they have to say. A very interactive and interesting questions. But this talk will go onto the YouTube channel. It will stay on the YouTube channel. Um, I, Stu, I see there's a question here. Um, so Daniel asks a question. Uh, what about the new terms that have been added to literature due to too many techniques like preservation rhinoplasty? So, Daniel, that's a good question. There have been lots of talks about preservation rhinoplasty. And if I could try and simplify it in my understanding what preservation rhinoplasty is, is about 30 years ago, there was a, a lot of cutting away of structures in the nose. So, Back, you, you can see what rhinoplasty is. They were all very similar. Everyone had this huge ski slope deformity. And there's this shift across to try and preserve as much as possible. And that's preserving different parts of the nose. So um, one of those things is what they call dorsal preservation. So the idea is if you have a big hook on your nose, instead of shaving the hook off to make the nose flat, what they'd want to do is they would now remove some of the the um, nasal bones and set them and actually like push it down so so you're trying to preserve that in the same way patangi's ligament is essential in rhinoplasty and there's techniques to try and preserve those um, what often used to happen is there was a cephalic trim so the lateral cartilages the top part here feels maybe a little bit bulbous when you finish. So people would cut that off and leave a little six millimeter area. And what often happened is you get this rotation of the nose up because of all the fibrous tissues and everything closes up like this. So now what we often are trying to do is a turn in or turn over flap and that strengthens the nose. And it also stops this terrible um, uh, shape you have afterwards. So pres pres preservation rhinoplasty is all about the minimal amount of cutting away with a maximal amount of results. I would encourage you to learn to do a basic rhinoplasty before getting into super difficult techniques like let down and push down and all these kind of things. They're not necessarily going to ask you that for your exams. You need to know what your basic way of doing a rhinoplasty is in the exams. Um, Guys, it's half past nine now. I think we, we're out of time, eh? It, we are. <laughs> yeah. But thank you so much, guys. Okay, guys, we're going to call it, call, it, call it quits then. So we'll yes. see you next Sunday night at eight o'clock again. Please feel Great. free to follow uh, the society on Instagram and send messages, et cetera, and questions. We really want to try and uh, give the residents and the fellows as much help as we can. So thank you very much for tonight.